one thing is dealing with hegemony and hegemony is very complex, complex because there's a canon being imposed all over the world, basically. Even the definition of art itself in certain ways is hegemonic. And second, it does not reflect really uh, a general culture on the periphery. So while in hegemony, art is a discipline that's fairly self-enclosed, you cannot understand what happens culturally on the periphery by isolating art as a discipline. So that was one concern. If you look at Latin America, particularly from the 60s to the 80s, you see that art is not just art in the traditional way, but it's part of a general movement that includes as much as visual art, it includes poetry, pedagogy, and politics, and uh, in this case, uh, theology of liberation and so on. So they are all like coming up from a common ground where if you only look at what comes up isolated, like a little fungus, you forget that underneath is this rhizomatic system that nourishes that, and that ultimately you only can understand one in the context of the other and not in itself. So the hegemonic view tends to force you to only see one fragment and evaluate that fragment on its own terms instead of understanding that it's really an accidental formalization of a broader thing. So I would say that, that I, I didn't think it as clearly when I started thinking about those things. But if I look back, that's really the structure in which I was thinking. And so I think the one of the triggers was the Tupamaro movement in Uruguay, because it clearly was not a purely military strategy that was informing that, but there was a surplus, there was an aesthetic addition to what was being done. It was not a totally efficiency oriented movement. And that made me see that there's actually a very blurry area of transition between politics and art. And on the other hand, you had Tucumán Arde in Argentina, which was uh, regardless the merits of the event in terms of purely artistic uh, views, it was definitely a move from art into politics that blurred the frontier from that point of view. So for me, that became like the support of the book. And it was also the support of an idea of the show of global conceptualism, which then changed because of practical issues. I mean, you cannot do a fully political research exhibition and have it funded in the US. So in that sense, global conceptualism was a show of compromises, but the book, tried not to be that. And what I was interested in was to see, okay, how do we deal with cultural identity if we don't follow hegemonic criteria? And I'm not an historian, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm just an artist. But it is my concern in my practice to place myself in that context. So the intention of the book really was not to make a, a definitive book about anything, but to lay the ground so that other people that know what they are doing can follow and analyze identity in those terms and not depend on the timing established by hegemony or on the ideology established by hegemony or by the canon given by hegemony. And see what happens if you work using a clock placed on the periphery instead of placed in New York or Paris or wherever. And 
analyze things in terms of the times of rupture in the moment in which it happened as rupture locally and not in terms of a centrist history of art. I discovered Simon Rodriguez, I think, rather late in, in, in the 80s. I saw a book by a compatriot of mine, which is Angel Ramar, who knew a while also we were friends. And uh, it's called the Ciudad Letrada, in which each chapter starts with a quote by Simon Rodriguez. So I figured, well, who is Simon Rodriguez? And started digging about it and found this incredible, fascinating figure that, in fact, if I have to mention somebody in history who I want to have a cup of coffee with, Simon Rodriguez is the person. And he not only predicted radical pedagogy in terms of uh, Latin America, I mean, he was a contemporary of Pestalozzi and influenced by Rousseau, but he really was interested in decolonization and in dealing locally. He wanted uh, the Quechua be taught in schools instead of Latin and things like that. I mean, and Spanish was a colonial language, according to him, and the vernacular developed in, in Latin America before it was Latin America for him was a valid language parallel to original Spanish and not a deformation. And the way he wrote was based on the tradition of calligrams. He was concerned with the erosion of information starting from what he would write and how it lands in the mind of the reader. And he started working on minimizing loss of information. And that was a problem typical of conceptualism later on. So given that, given the form he gave to his message, which was changing fonts, changing sizes, diagramming the page instead of linear uh, description of his thoughts, uh, basically 70 years before Mallarmé predicting that format, only Mallarmé was interested in musical form and Simón Rodríguez wasn't interested in art at all. He was really focused on how do I get my message across without losing information. And that was a political stand and not a formalist stand. So all that became very crucial for me as an origin. Not many people knew about Simon Rodriguez. Rama sort of put him on the table. He actually later made a, an anthology of his writings, and which was very useful. And he was an amazing mind and a very eccentric mind, which I also like very much. So in that sense, Simon Rodriguez gave me a frame of reference for where am I, from where do I come in terms of my thinking? And even if we don't know or didn't know about him, he synthesized the form of thought, the form of confronting colonial reality that was an incredibly important guide and I think still is an important guide for what we're doing. So then suddenly I realized, hey, Paulo Freire, whom I admire very much, is my intellectual generation. I and mean, he's a little bit older or was a little bit older, but he comes from the same ground that I come and Illich comes from the same ground and the theologians of liberation come from the same ground and ultimately Che Guevara came from the same ground and so on. So it is actually, I, my politicization coincided with Guevara being, um, I mean, we were triggered by the same event, which was a bombing of Guatemala. It was a little bit more important, but 
in any case. So we have to start thinking not in terms of individual units, but in terms of a collective cultural movement and basically an anonymous movement in which the names are not that important except for communicating among each other, but not more than that. So all that landed in the book. Conceptual art is a hegemonic construction that is based on a reductive analysis of art in certain ways. I mean, this is simplifying because you cannot really group all the artists that are classed as conceptual as purely conceptual and some are political conceptual and closer to conceptualism and so on. So words are very tricky because they include and exclude things that sometimes are on the borderline. But what was understood as conceptual art and was placed between 1965 and 1975, which was also bizarre timing. I mean, why that decade? was really concerned with art problems. So it was a narrow um, focused movement. It was uh, in certain ways looking for the essence of art by dematerializing uh, the art object. You were like peeling away all the craft issues, the craft associations and you were like peeling an onion, trying to find the soul of art. In that sense, it was a nearly mystical movement from my point of view. And ultimately not that interesting, if I have to be frank, because the issues it dealt with in an orthodox way were not uh, that helpful for, for cultural development. Conceptualism is really, uh, for me, and, and this issue came up in a clear way with Peter Wallen in con Global Conceptualism, in which he counterposed Solewit to Kosus. And Solewit was for him a conceptualist, and uh, Kosus was a formalist or a conceptualist. And I thought that was very interesting, although it didn't cover what I wanted to cover. Uh, ultimately, conceptualism is a set of strategies that are based on thinking, on problems, formulation, and on cognition. And within that, if you do that in colonial situations, it becomes a heavily political search for strategies. And that became very clear to me in Latin America, which was my field of areas. But today I would say it's not Latin America, it's periphery or colonial situations, which still exist. As long information is controlled, you have people that emit information and people that consume it. And the consumer is in a colonial situation. So it's not anymore a geography, but I was still thinking in geography. And uh, on that basis, in 1991, I think it was, there was an exhibit in Antwerp called The Bride of the Sun which Catherine de Seger organized and uh, we're friends, we still are good friends. And it's a, it was an amazing show, which unfortunately never traveled. And it was funded by the Belgian government to show how important Belgian colonialism was for Latin America. I mean, it was really oddly uh, wrong politician political 
application of money, but Catherine tried to counteract that. And in any case, the show was remarkable because it counterposed contemporary art with archaeological, I mean, true archaeological art and colonial art and having them in dialogue. So it wasn't a chronological show, but it was a dialogical show and it was really interesting. But it was focused on art. It was focused or at least too much on art. I mean, there were numismatics and other things, but it was on the visual formalization of things and not on a conceptual level or on a political level. And at that time, uh, I mean, I was in the show as an artist, but being a friend of Catherine, I challenged her, said, why don't you put a video of operations of the Tupamaros in the show, which was my obsession. And uh, so I gave her a long list of how I would make the show, which was very presumptuous. And she said, oh, that's just great. Why don't you write it down? It may be material for another show. <laughs> and that took her me off bothering her, but launched me into another process of thinking. And so I started writing about that. And then with Jane Farver and Rachel Weiss, which were also close friends, and Rachel is still one of my closest friends, and Jane unfortunately died. They decided, well, let's make it. And Jane was the chief curator at the Queen's Museum. So we started working on that show. Then we realized that funding Latin American art and on top of that political, was a political band was unrealistic in the US. So we decided to go a step further and make it universal and then make it a global show. But that global show was focused on, okay, let's decenter art at least even if we maintain art. And let's point out that hegemony is a province in a federation of provinces in which there are other languages and other applications of art that are equally important and that are being submerged in this hegemonic focus. So that's what made it universal. So we had 11 curators, international curators, one per region. So Okwia Wenzel was for Africa, Peter Wallen was for uh, Canada and the US, uh, Maria Car Mari Carmen Ramirez was for Latin America, and so on and so on. And each one of us had control over a couple of those curators and tried to guide them into the direction we wanted, which wasn't always easy. And it's not something I want to do again, but it was fun. So the show ended up doing that. And uh, so the US had as much floor space as Latin America, which still was in balance, but at least put it into some perspective. And Europe had the same area and Africa had the same area and square footage. So the message was clear here art is taking different shapes in different geographies, different cultures. And we used an idea that Jane introduced, which was let's use 1968 as a reference, but not the 1968 in Paris or in Los Angeles or in New York but 1968 as a mark of rupture. And what, when was 1968 in other places? So in Japan, 1968 was 1950. In Latin America, it was early 50s, 1951 and so on, actually connected with American military bases being constructed in these spaces. In China, it was 1981 when the 
famous wall was destroyed. In Korea, it was uh, 1981, I think, when the Kwangju rebellion was. So each region had its moment of rupture that demanded the use of easily transmittable messages. And therefore, there was dematerialization involved, but not for the search of the soul of art, but to save itself from repression, mostly. And that made it a very political exhibition. So that was the intention of global conceptualism. And the book, Didactics of Liberation, sort of carried that further. I mean, it started as some pages before the show, but then I went into dealing with Latin America and trying to see, okay, how can we acknowledge, first of all, that identity is not a program you follow, but it's a consequence of what you do. It is recognized later. And for me, Latin American conceptualism was a clear example of that. There was no concerted effort to illustrate an identity. There was a need in different countries to bypass dictatorship and military and still try to raise awareness among the population, even if it was only the colleagues, it didn't matter. But it was that kind of mushrooming in the continent that ultimately made Latin American conceptualism a much more identity bound movement than any folkloric, uh, nostalgic uh, manifestation of which there were some in the 80s trying to rescue artisan, local artisanship and so on, and integrate mud and hay into artwork. And that didn't survive long, but Latin American conceptualism is still a some currency, some agency. Well, in, in, in certain ways, what happened with Latin American conceptualism is that uh, the most politically engaged bypassed the gallery system and sought other ways of communication. And uh, male art was a big example for that. Uh, even many male artists went to jail for subversion and so on, but there was no way for any army to really control the flow of information. We couldn't open all envelopes to see is this allowable or not. So that was an efficient way. And it also was a way of opening borderlines, geographic borderlines that otherwise were closed. So there was an international appeal. There were mixtures with other complaints. And there was a sense of community that transcended the the narrow art community in a given place. But besides that, it also developed a, a little bit what, what the yes men in the US did, which is to follow uh, a logic, a hegemonic logic or an oppressive logic to the point, to the extreme of self-destruction without editorializing. That is what happens if you go all the way. And uh, that ultimately achieving ridicule of the system itself. And that to some extent was also a technique applied. So uh, I don't know, the, the classic, although a little bit Later was uh, Lottie Rosenfeld's uh, mass is using the lines on the street to make a plus sign 
and put a no next to it. And that became like a meme before there were memes. It was picked up by a lot of people and uh, popularly and suddenly uh, no more became a heavily politically loaded message that everybody understood and that nothing could be done against it. And how can you prohibit the plus sign? <laughs> From a, a biographical point of view, which is not too interesting, I always was interested in education. And in fact, my uh, thinking in about education was in art school. I milit was a militant towards curricular change from a very academic kind of a school. So I had some coherence in my educational thinking, way more developed than my artistic language. And while I was a traditional expressionist of sorts, dealing with my own neurosis and thinking that were interesting for other people. In education, I had a totally opposite ideology, which was about how do we energize the people so that they become independent. And uh, it took me several years to bring both things into face. But I would say today, I'm not interested in an art that is to be cherished as an icon, but in an art that forces the viewer to start thinking independently and develop their own creative mechanisms to cope with reality. So it's about transmitting systems of knowledge so that new cognition can evolve rather than confirm knowledge that already exists. And that makes art pedagogical and not just a consumer affair. And I think that one of the ruptures produced in art in the early 60s was shifting from the object that symbolized the relation between the artist and the object in the making and having a dialogue with the object and feedback from the material, a little bit like abstract expressionism to some extent, or Pollock who his work, his creation was really, okay, now I stop. The decision when to stop was uh, creation, but it was a dialogue between the canvas and him, not between the canvas and the people. And with conceptualism that shifted and it became a dialogue between the object and the viewer or between the artist through the object and the viewer. But that meant that problems came in and took over the importance of problems became bigger than the importance of craftsmanship. And today, when we look back, and that goes back to what I said about Michelangelo, you don't look anymore at, oh, how well done it is, I love it, but how interesting the problem that is being addressed is. Does that tell me anything or not, okay? So I'm still get angry when somebody asks me, oh, what do you do? And I say, I'm an artist. And I says, oh, you paint. And it's like asking a philosopher, what do you do? I am a philosopher. Oh, you are a typist. And it's exactly the same, it's a parallel construction that illustrates the demeaning of the activity of art instead of being asked, oh, what problem are you researching with your work? Which is really what we're doing. So that would be the shift from the 60s to today. That makes education an integrated field with art. 
Now then comes the question, educating for what? And that's where it becomes political, okay? So I'm trying to educate towards emancipation. Other people are trying to educate towards submission. And that's uh, market art versus uh, edu really educational art. Well, I think one of the shortcomings of the book, and today I would write it differently, is that ultimately it had kind of Latin American nationalism. That is, instead of being a country nationalist, I was a continental nationalist. And there are arguments in favor of that, of course, and I'm not reneging of that identity. I mean, I understand much better somebody from Ecuador than somebody from Poland. But still, it, it is bound, first of all, it's really a class thing. That is the middle class of the countries in Latin America have more in common than the people of Latin America have, except for being colonized, for being subject to imperialism, mostly US. And so the resistance is common, but I don't know if that's enough. So I would today go more into cognitive processes and see how is, where does cognition develop? And I, I mentioned earlier that uh, ultimately it's a neighborhood that gives me identity. Where I went to school, how the street smells, the neighbors who I played ball with on the street, things like that are very close to me and very influential in how I grew up and they make my identity so that I should have a passport from my neighborhood more than from Uruguay, which I know spottedly, or Latin America that I know even less. And the parts I know of Latin America are very a fragment that is not representative of the country, which is like my walking from the hotel to a museum. That doesn't qualify me as a specialist on a country, okay? so. Those issues, I think, are limitation of the book. There's a generalization in the book that today doesn't hold up for me. So it's not that I will take the book out of circulation, but it is something to think about. That is, who are you and why are you? And looking for that answer, uh, you should not just take a formula to help you, but use your experience. 